Welcome to the Library of Congress National Book Festival. I am Stephanie Mary, Book World Editor of the Washington Post. When Joe Ide introduced the world to Isaiah Kuntabe in 2016 with his debut novel, it felt like a fresh new protagonist. Sure, we'd seen LA-based sleuths before, from Bosch to Easy Rollins, but Isaiah, or IQ as he's known, felt different. He's a South Central detective with the smarts of Sherlock Holmes and the swagger of Steve McQueen. A criminal who went straight and a private eye who's calm and collected while working through his share of grief. He also provides fans of crime fiction with a window onto a world they've never seen before, the world of South Central LA, which is also the world where Joe grew up. Joe, ha Joe has proved himself not just a capable writer, but also a fast one. Since IQ came out in 2016, winning an Edgar Award. He's published two well-received sequels, Righteous and Wrecked. His fourth IQ novel, High Five, comes out in January. He'll be signing copies of his books at 6.30 on the lower level. It is my pleasure to welcome Joe Ide to the stage. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming out. Um, a little background first. I grew up in South Central LA in an area that was full of crime and gangs and all the inherent problems of the hood. But as an experience, it wasn't any different than what millions of people go through every day. My grandparents lived in the area because it was close to Little Tokyo. And my family lived with them because we were just getting by. My grandparents were very old world. They spoke almost no English. They were stern, they were formal, and very traditional. My, um, my grandfather collected samurai swords, and uh, he had a Japanese garden. My, my grandmother had a koi pond, and she wore these beautiful silk kimonos around the house, and, and they treated me like somebody else's cat. You know what I mean? Like, they couldn't actually kill me, but they didn't have to be nice to me either. <laughs> my parents aspired to get out of the hood and be Brady Bunch mainstream, and, and that's what they wanted for their kids, me and my brothers. But we adapted to the neighborhood. Our friends were black, so we co-opted their speech, style, attitudes, musical taste. So there was always this cultural, generational tension within the family, made more so by the fact that both my parents and my grandparents wanted us kids to have some connection to our, to our own cultural heritage, which never really turned out the way they had hoped. My parents made me take a ceramics class in Little Tokyo. It was taught by a very famous artist. He was from Japan friend of my grandfather's. So I get there, and there's eight or 10 of these obsessively clean-cut suburban Japanese kids, and there I am, you know, the toothpick in my mouth, and wearing my Ray-Bans indoors, and I know I have to get out of this. There's no way I'm gonna stay in this class, but I couldn't just blow it off because I get into it with my parents. So here's what I did. Everything I made looked somehow phallic. It wasn't obvious, you know, but it wasn't, it wasn't subtle. It would it'd be like a perfectly ordinary teapot, but you, you wouldn't necessarily want to pick it up by the handle. <laughs> my, um, my older brother Jack, he got kicked out of a Japanese Boy Scout troop for buying his merit badges. You know, he didn't, he didn't get the whole Boy Scout concept. And my brother, he had him you know, running up and down his arms, and I'm, I'm four years younger. And I'm incredibly jealous because my parents were so proud of him. And what made it all the more aggravating was that I, I knew it was a scam, and I knew my hood rat brother couldn't build a wigwam or paddle around in a kayak. And sort of the, the net result of all of this 
was that I was culturally all over the place. I wasn't black, I wasn't white. I fell way far from being Japanese. So through most of that time, I really felt like I didn't fit in. I didn't belong anywhere. And I think that's why I was so drawn to the original Sherlock Holmes. Here's a guy like me, doesn't fit in, doesn't belong, but Sherlock had an identity. You know, he was confident. If he faced problems, he could overcome them with just his intelligence. That was a big idea for me because it meant there was a way for a kid like me to face his world and not be afraid. And when it came time to write a book, all of this came together virtually by itself and Sherlock in the Hood was born. I'm asked a lot about character, where they come from, how they're created. And I think it's a lot about empathy, the writer's ability to get inside the character's head and see the world the way they do. Not to judge, but to understand why they do what they do. If the writer doesn't understand that, how do they know what the character will do or say in any given situation? I mean, suppose you walk into the den, there's your husband, lying on the couch watching TV. And the first thing you do is make a judgment. He's such an incredible slob. I mean, how hard is it to wear both slippers? You know, it, th there's no point wearing a robe if you're not gonna close it in the front. <laughs> Instead of asking yourself, why is there a vacant look in his eyes? Why is he watching a program he doesn't like? Why is he wearing a bathrobe at 5.30 in the afternoon? Because it's the obvious thing for him to be doing, given how he's thinking and feeling. And it's the writer's job to tell you that. My first girlfriend, Stephanie Farrington, she was 11, so I was 10. She lived two doors down. She was a head taller than me and outweighed me by 30 pounds. My brother said that when we held hands, she looked like a ventriloquist with a Japanese dummy. <laughs> I always thought that was a little harsh. <laughs> well, everybody in the neighborhood was struggling, but Stephanie's family was destitute. There was never any food in the house and hardly any furniture. She had a little brother, a little sister who was always running around half naked crying. And her mother was a drunk. You know, she just, she walked around with this sawed off piece of broomstick and just hit who was ever closest to her. And Stephanie came out of it with this attitude that I, I gave to a character named Deronda in the first IQ book. And that is, whatever I get in this life, I'll have to take it. And whatever that is, it won't be enough. I used to share my lunches with Stephanie, and she would complain about the sandwiches. You know, Tell your mother I don't like mustard. You know? And she was like that about everything. Whatever it was, it was the wrong thing. It was the wrong size, it was the wrong color, it's not the one she wanted. Because nothing would ever make up for her life of deprivation or fill that well of needs that would never be met. And because I knew Stephanie, I could write Deronda. There's, um, there's a tendency, I think, especially in the crime genre, to define a character by two things. One is lifestyle. He lives in a penthouse, he drives a Maserati, he lives in a log cabin, he drives an old Jeep. I don't have any, I don't have any beef with that kind of stuff. You know, I, I use it myself. But it's really not the substance of character. The substance of character is their emotional life, what they're thinking and feeling as they're doing whatever it is they're doing. I'm not really impressed, you know, with somebody who, who throws people off rooftops. I can throw somebody off a rooftop. 
What interests me is what that character is thinking and feeling, even with, um, with bad guys. You can't really understand a bad guy until you realize he's a good guy in his own life. The bad guy in um, Wrecked is an ex-CIA officer named Walzak. He was at Abu Ghraib. Now he runs a big security company like Blackwater. So we know he's, he's cruel, ruthless, powerful. There's nothing new there. Walzak is looking for a woman named Sarah. She has photos of him at Abu Ghraib doing terrible things. And this is his reflection. He envisioned the photos appearing in the New York Times and on CNN. He could see the media outrage metastasizing to every country in the world, his name synonymous with cruelty, depravity, and perversion. The most excruciating part, his family. The business was Earth, and he was Atlas. His family was the only true source of happiness and the only people he knew who still saw him as a patriot and a hero and a great human being. He loved family outings, soccer games, holidays, barbecues in the backyard. He even wore a chef's hat and cooked the hamburgers to perfection. He had to destroy those pictures. The thought of his darling wife, Patty, seeing him rape a helpless woman made him sick. The thought of his precious son, Noah, knowing his father was a monster, made him want to die. He'd never been so afraid not when the desert night was lit with tracer rounds and the mortar shells exploded so close you thought you were finished and you could hear your fellow soldiers screaming and dying in the rubble. None of it frightened him more than the revelation of his beastly heart. I don't have that, I don't have a character. I also try and define character through dialogue. Dodson, is a, um, a former street hustler. He's slick, he's opportunist, he's um, incredibly self-involved, but he's recently had a new baby. So for a guy like this, the responsibility is overwhelming. And here, he talks it over with his friend Isaiah. What's flaming, son? Dodson said. He strolled in like the landlord, an icy breeze with an attitude, condensed of stature but walking large. So what's up with you? Nothing special, Isaiah said. How's Micah? Dotson made a face like he was remembering a car accident. Man, that baby is work. You know he can't do nothing for himself? Can't even hold his oversized head up. You got to watch him all the damn time. Uh, you didn't know that going in, Isaiah said. Knowing and doing is two different things. You know Sharice makes me wash my hands every time I pick him up? I don't keep my toothbrush that clean. And the kid is always spitting up, and he farts like he's full of propane. I couldn't believe it first time I changed his diaper. He don't eat nothing but mother's milk, and his shit's the same color as hot dog mustard. <laughs> and for some reason, we always hurrying and rushing around. Why, I couldn't tell you. Damn baby ain't no bigger than a pot roast, and he ain't going nowhere. And everything's a damn crisis. The boy gets a rash on his ass, and Sharice and her mama carry on like he had a tumor on his neck. I said, what y'all worried about? Everybody gets a rash on their ass at one time or another. I got a rash on my ass right now. How'd that go over? Like I fought it at a funeral. And Sharice, Sharice done lost her sense of humor altogether. Other night, I'm changing a boy's diaper, trying to keep it light, you know how I do. I said, Sharice, check this out. Baby's got a heart on him, takes after his daddy too. Girl didn't crack a smile. And her mama looked at me like I was crip walking on her grave. And check this, I got to use my inside voice. The fuck does that mean? I am inside. <laughs> Elmore Leonard said, everybody talks. Meaning, everybody's articulate. Everybody can say exactly what they want to say in their own vernacular. And what it does, it elevates the character. No, Dodson is no longer a hustler. He's this hustler. He's this particular hustler. Fictional characters can't possibly be as complex as actual human beings, but opinions help flesh them out. Uh, they fall somewhere between an abstract and abstraction, 
you know, you're trying to give some specifics while at the same time give a feeling of the character, a gestalt. In the next book, High Five, it's coming out in January, the bad guy is an elderly man named Angus Byrne. He's been selling weapons to the cartels for, for decades, and he succeeded through sheer brutality and cunning. But over the years, he's turned bitterly cynical. His reflection. There was that old adage, guns don't kill people, people do. And they killed him with all kinds of other things, too, Angus thought. Knives, hammers, tire irons, baseball bats, and bolt action deer rifles. The blame lies with the bear. True enough, Angus thought, as far as it went. What you can't do with any of those things is go into a classroom at an elementary school and slaughter all the children at the same time. And what was that other chestnut, Angus thought? Oh, yeah that you needed an AR-15, a 30-round clip, and a 1,000 rounds of ammo to defend your family against what exactly? A swarm of tigers? An invading army from Canada? No. The real reason gun advocates believed they needed an arsenal was to defend themselves against the US government when, in clear violation of the Second Amendment, its agents came to confiscate your guns. Angus shook his head whenever he heard some numbskull say that. There were 300 million guns in the country. The government couldn't confiscate 300 million car keys. There was no stopping the arms trade or even slowing it down. And if you're a ball bearing somewhere in that wheel, don't be a pussy. Accept your part in it. It disgusted Angus when he heard gun people try and weasel out of their responsibilities. If you profited from a product manufactured specifically to kill people, you were, to one degree or another, culpable. And if you can't handle it, take an immunity pill from human suffering and get on with your fucking business. That was a character, by the way. I, I try and keep myself out of it. <laughs> Secondary characters might, might not take up a lot of page space, but sometimes they're pivotal. And because I write a series, I want the reader to remember the character from book to book. So I tried to give each of them sort of a trademark. TK is an old man who runs a wrecking yard. And in his case, it's his sense of humor. Later, when they were back on the lawn chairs, drinking cold beers and eating takeout pizza, so there are these three old men you see, TK said. And one of them says, 60 is the worst age there is. You feel like you need to pee, and nothing comes out. And the second old man says, that ain't nothing. When you're 70, you can't even take a dump without eating the bran muffin. And the third old man says, you boys don't know nothing about trouble till you're 80. I pee and take a dump every morning at exactly 6 a.m. And the first old man says, well, if you can do all that every morning at 6 a.m., what's your problem? And the third old man says, I don't get up till 7. You know, it doesn't make any difference how lucid I am. People remember the joke. <laughs> you know, sometimes I'm asked, did any of my real life experiences, you know, go directly into a book? And my answer is sort of. What happened is that my growing up got filtered through the life I've lived. And what remains is a kind of emotional residue. Right around the corner from my house, there was a liquor store, A&J Liquor. Winos used to sit out there in orange crates and drink Thunderbird all day. And one of them was a man named Beck. Beck was elderly. He was very tall. And, and he had a very dignified way of carrying himself. You know, he reminded me a little of Morgan Freeman. And Beck was always immaculate. He wore this rust-colored Hamburg hat, you know, the kind with the little feather in it? herringbone sport coat, shirt and tie, brown slacks with a crease in them, and brown and white spectator shoes. Beck was sharp, and he did this every day. Now, my older brother's name is Jack, so Beck called me Little Jack, and he called my mother Mrs. Jack. <laughs> my mother, five feet tall, very prim and proper, and exceedingly polite. 
Mom didn't care who you were, where you came from. If you were mannerly, if you were a gentleman, you were okay with her. So every morning, Mom would go down to the bus stop, catch a bus for work, and Beck would be waiting for her. And she would say, good morning, Beck, how are you? And he would say, oh, I'm old and slow, Mrs. Jack, but I'm doing all right. And Beck would stay with her until the bus came just to see that nobody messed with her, and nobody ever did because Beck carried a gun. <laughs> and I still have this, of this image of them, you know, um, this tall, elegantly dressed wino and my little mom standing at the bus stop talking like they were old friends, and maybe they were. And there was such a, a sweetness about it, a wistfulness. And that was the emotional residue and the kind of thing I try and put down on the page above and beyond story. My older brother Jack was something of a thug. He was into drugs, he got arrested numerous times. Uh, belonged, he belonged to a gang called the Outlaws. And when he was in high school, he had a girlfriend named Sugar. Sugar was always spilling out of her clothes you know, she had an attitude, she was always chewing gum, and she had this rep, you know, for getting in your face if you looked at her wrong. So one Sunday, Jack thinks everybody's at church. So he brings her in. I'm sitting there watching TV. Jack suddenly realizes that our prim and proper mom is coming this way. So he rushes off to steer her in another direction, and it's just me and Sugar. I'm nothing to her. I'm a houseplant. She doesn't even bother to look at me, but then my grandmother comes in. So there's Sugar and my grandmother standing there looking at each other. You have never seen two more different people in your life. There's my grandmother straight out of a 16th century samurai movie, and there's Sugar who could have been a stand-in for little Kim. Now, I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, the, the tension is killing me. You know? Is my grandmother going to lash out with a karate chop? You know, is, is sugar going to get in my grandmother's face? So finally, sugar says, do you have any Dr. Pepper? And my grandmother said, no, I have a tea. And sugar said, I don't like tea. And my grandmother said, no, you come, I make tea. And the two of them went off into the kitchen together. <laughs> I don't know, you know, if that scene is ever going to make it into a book. But what I distilled from that experience was that incredible sense of tension from just two people standing in a room looking at each other. I thought that was remarkable. And what was even better was a look on my brother's face when he saw my grandmother and Sugar having tea. <laughs> and those are the kinds of things I try and get down on the page, above and beyond story. It's the hardest thing I do. And I'm only ever successful part of the time, and most of the time I strike out altogether. But I love that process, which is fortunate because any time I get outside the realm of my imagination, I am incredibly incompetent. There's hardly anything I can do of a practical nature with any sense of proficiency. In fact, there's a saying in my family that goes, if your plane crashes in the Amazon and you need to survive, Joe is the one that you should kill and eat. Also a little harsh. <laughs> so you can understand why I'm grateful all of you for allowing me to write for a living. It's a luxury. It's a privilege. It's a life I always wanted, but n never really thought I'd lead. All of my characters are composites except for one. There was only one character who made it 
from my growing up directly into a book. Right across the street from that liquor store, there was a pool hall, Stamps Pool Hall. My brother used to hang out in there, but it was, it was too scary for me. You know, it's one of those places where everybody's on parole and the, the hookers like to show you their bullet wounds. So there was a pimp who hung out there, and his name was Charlie O, the initial O. And Charlie was your, your conventional pimp. You had the perm, silk shirt, ring on every finger, white alligator loafers. And once I asked Charlie, you know, what the O in his, his name stood for, and he said it meant, oh my God, you must be crazy. <laughs> and according to Charlie, that's, that's what a woman would say the first time she saw his penis. You meet people like that, you have to write a book. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming out. If you have questions, I'll, I'll try and answer them. Yes, thank you so much for your wonderful work. It's just phenomenal, and I and so many others were delighted by reading your first and the subsequent books. I have two que brief questions. One is, in terms of um, your heritage and writing about African American characters and communities and using, you know, the, the lingo and jargon, you know, as, you know, accurately as you can, do you, do you get pushback or negative feedback in any way from African American co community or readers? That's one and two. How hard was it to actually get your first book published and accepted? What did you have to go through? Anyway, you, what you've done is remarkable, but I'm very interested Thank you. in that. I haven't had any pushback, which I'm surprised, and why I couldn't tell you. Um, Getting my book published is one of those stories that make other writers really nauseous. <laughs> so I worked on the manuscript for three years. I had to take a second out on the house to finish it. I'm finished. I got this manuscript, but I don't know anybody in publishing, nobody. So I'm passing it out to readers, and I have this cousin. His name is Francis Fukuyama. He's a world-renowned political scientist. He was the one who wrote The End of History, predicted the fall of the Soviet Union, huge resume. He's on the board at RAND, you know, he's one of those kind of guys. So I asked him if he'd read it, and he's a sweet guy. He said, sure. I didn't hear back from him for a long time, but I wasn't surprised. I mean, he's on the board at RAND. But then I did hear back. And he asked me, he said he liked the book. He said, do you have an agent? And I said, no, I gotta, gotta go get one. And he said, let me introduce you to my agent, who turned out to be a woman named Esther Newberg at ICM in New York, arguably one of the top three literary agents in New York. So that was the first person who read my book. And um, Esther being Esther, she sold in a matter of weeks. And, um, I don't tell that story to other writers. <laughs> um, I love your books. Thank you. Uh, so I'll say that first. But uh, not to make any assumptions about your age, but you, you published your first book in 2016. You started working on it in 2013. About? About. Um, so what held Body and Soul together before that? Oh, I was a failed screenwriter. I, um, I always wanted to write, you know, but it's, it's like everybody always wants to write. When I started with screenplays because I thought it was easy, but it's remarkably difficult to write a good one. I had a friend, a, a, an acquaintance who was an agent. I wrote exactly one dozen crappy screenplays. And he would send them back with a note. This sucks. <laughs> this is intensely boring. No one will want to see this. So 
on the 13th one, I wrote a decent screenplay. It sold at Disney, and I started to work. I worked fairly frequently. I worked for most of the major studios, and I did assignments and rewrites and that kind of stuff. Nothing ever got made. And if nothing else, I have a work ethic. I'd knock myself out on a script, and then the head of the studio would get fired, or the star wants too much money, or some Hollywood reason. So I, I burned out. I could not do it anymore. I would open the screenplay program and get physically repulsed. So I called my agent. I said, well, I'm quitting. He didn't say anything. <laughs> I mean, nobody really noticed. <laughs> so I was, I was depressed, like clinically depressed for a couple of years. I did, if I wasn't a screenwriter, who was I? You know, so I went for long, soulful walks with my dog. <laughs> and felt incredibly sorry for myself. But at a certain point, you know, I had to pay the mortgage. And as I said, my only real skill is writing. So I decided to write a novel. We're all glad you did. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, Deronda is both my favorite and my least favorite character. So oh. she's really complex. But my question is, when you go home, do you get, um, comments or questions or blowback from, hey, that's me, or that's something you took from me? No. I, most, almost all the people that I know back in the old neighborhood are either dead or in jail. No, I only have one friend, actually my best friend who still lives there, same house he always lived in. If you step out his front door and you throw a rock, you can hit the Santa Monica freeway. And he's, um, he fixes cars, and he's exactly the way he was. And my acquaintances, the people that I knew there, are, are, are the same, are the same as they were. But most of my personal friends are gone. Um, so I haven't had any pushback. I haven't. I'd like to ask about your writing of dialogue. I, I get the sense from your speaking that that's just something that you, that you do really well, but do you have a process for, for writing dialogue to make it sound true and, and genuine? Like most things, it comes out of, out of characters with substance. If, if the character has levels, if he feels like a real person, then he has a point of view. So you know what he's gonna say. You know what he's gonna say in that situation. And then it's a question of how he would say it. And the vernacular was, was my first language. I mean, I had to learn to talk like this. <laughs> um, and it's, it's practice, I mean, in the movie business, I wrote a lot of dialogue. And uh, this is sort of a continuation. It's, um, it, it, it's one of the parts of the writing that I really enjoy. I love writing dialogue. I love when two people, two smart people go at it. And they don't have to be intellectually smart, just smart in their own way. That's fun. Great. Thanks. Hi, thanks. I've been in love with all these books and I couldn't wait for the last one and IQ just breaks my heart. I'm a little worried that you're never going to let him be happy. Um, but I, I'm a middle school teacher and I think uh, what sucked me in was that idea of somebody maybe on the spectrum dealing with trauma. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that part of his character. Wait, I, I, didn't, I didn't quite understand the question. Go again. Well, for me, I kind of always think of him, your main character, as being somebody maybe a little bit on the autistic spectrum. Maybe I'm saying that, thinking that wrong. Um, but just the way he interacts with people. And he's so smart. Um, but dealing with the, the trauma of his brother's death. Mm. And, and then how do you heal from that when you're so alone and kind of isolated? I think his community saves him a lot, but maybe I'm reading more into that. I was just wondering what you how you kind of dealt with that or what you think of that. If, um, if you've ever been the, the victim of violence, 
you know you don't get over it. You don't get past it. It becomes part of you. It, it becomes part of the way you see the world. You incorporate that into yourself. And that's what I try to do with Isaiah. I try to make his traumatic experiences part of who he is. And one of the things that I think is skipped over a lot, particularly in my genre, is what happens to the victims. You know, somebody gets shot and then he gets shot. That's not how it happens. Man, you get shot, that changes you. You see your mortality just like that. And it makes you afraid. It makes you afraid. And, and so Isaiah is always on edge, and he's always wary, and he's always a little afraid. So maybe this is a cliche question, but who are the writers and who are the characters in other books that you admire? Um, Walter Mosley and, and Elmore Leonard are my gods. You know, I've read all of their, their books multiple times, and the original Sherlock Holmes. 52 stories, four novels. I read them multiple times before I left middle school. Um, those were the biggest, those were the basis. And then along the way, there have been all kinds of writers, the same writers that, that you appreciate, that I've, um, I've, taken th I've taken things from them. I've just shoplifted all kinds of things from other writers. Um, I guess the writer that I reread re the most is John Le Carre. Spy novels are just crime novels in another country. <laughs> and um, I love his precision. He writes beautifully, but with such precision. And George, George Smiley's my guy. George Smiley is my guy. And he's really another form of Isaiah. films or television shows, do you have a cast in mind? Do you know who play who? No. <laughs> <laughs> they, um, they, 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 they bought the manuscript in 2015, and they just now got a pilot written. It's a good pilot. It's really good. It was written by a guy named Matt Carnahan, who, who came from the House of Lies, writer-producer from that show. And there are a bunch of other writers involved. But they just now finished the pilot. So I don't know if anybody's thinking about casting. I myself, I don't pay attention to it. You know, I have a day job now. I know what that business is like. They're going to do what they're going to do with or without me, without me. So, you know, just send me the check. I'll be fine. When you wrote your first novel, did you have multiple novels in mind, or was, were you just intending to do one? And if you had multiples in mind, kind of what are some of the things you thought about to set up the future books in the series? Um, it, it, it was always going to be a series. Assuming I got the first one published, it was always going to be a series. I wanted to write a series where the characters grew from novel to novel. I didn't want to write the same book twice. And, and so if you've read the books, you'll see how Isaiah is completely alone in the second book, in the first book. In the second, he starts to reach out. In the third, he has a girlfriend. And Dotson starts out completely self-involved. And um, he gets closer to Isaiah. They become partners. And then Isaiah, he, Dotson has a kid. And so I want to see where that goes, because I don't know. I don't know where that goes, but I'm, I'm fascinated with the prospect. I don't know what Deron is going to do. <laughs> I have no idea. So uh, you, you and I will both find out at the same time. Well, thank you all for coming out. I had a good time. <laughs>